Morning all. All right, so I've spent the last hour roughly putting this together uh, since Jarmo Kekalainen was let go by the Columbus Blue Jackets today. And it's interesting because John Davidson, the man that brought him in as general manager back in 2013, is now the man that takes over uh, and is in search of a brand new general manager for the team. So February 13th, 2013 is when Jarmo Kekalainen became the first ever European born. Uh, general manager of a National Hockey League team. I think he did an all right job. Now, I, I understand there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, going over some of the mistakes he made over the last few years. But I think considering the entire body of work, I think he did all right. Uh, so it's interesting that February 13th, 2013 until February 15th, 2024, that's his timeline as general manager. So almost exactly 11 years after he's brought in as general manager, they let him go. Now, the key team is currently 16, 26, and 10. They are 18 points behind the number two wild card in the East, which is currently the spot held by the Detroit Red Wings. So, one thing that's going to get talked about a lot is the moves made over the last couple of years. And they haven't worked out. And they're moves that at the time, honestly, I thought, you know what? This is pretty aggressive. I like seeing a Columbus GM being aggressive. One talking point that's been out there with the Columbus Blue Jackets for years now is that certain players, uh, they'll, they won't play in Columbus and you have a hard time signing those big name players. Signing Johnny Goudreau went against that, that narrative, right? So he signs a contract. There's a no movement clause with this contract. $9.75 million a year until 2029. And honestly, coming off the year that he had had in Calgary, that cap hit wasn't crazy. He had had a great year in Calgary, and it looked like maybe, you know, Columbus was ready to, to revamp that offense and get things going. But this year for Goudreau, 52 games, 7 goals, 28 assists, 35 points. Um, Johnny Goudreau's numbers would be would be fine if he was making $4 million a year. But at $9.75 million, the expectations are going to be higher. Roslovic makes $4 million a year. He's a UFA this summer. 29 games, 3 goals, 8 assists, 11 points. I have Roslovic on the board because I figure he very likely gets traded. And if you're going to make this move with Kakalina now, it makes some sense because you're only a few weeks out from the trade deadline. If ownership didn't have the, the, the belief that uh, Kakalina could navigate the trade deadline the way they wanted him to, then you make this move, right? Now, they're pending restricted free agents up front. It's interesting to look at their upcoming restricted free agents because these guys are going to get a raise. But how much are they worth? So we'll start with Marchenko. $925,000 is his cap hit. Of course, it's up this year. Uh, 50 games played, 15 goals, 12 assists, 27 points. So if Marchenko wants to get paid like a 20-25 goal scorer, that's going to get into the 3 to $4 million range, right? Now, if Marchenko decides... You know what? I've got more, I've got potential to be more than that. He may want more than that. Uh, Sillinger, $925,000 a year for him. I don't think we're going to see a raise that's that much for Sillinger. 47 games, 8 goals, 11 assists, 19 points. Probably a two-year deal. I, I don't think it'll be a long-term deal for Sillinger because he's still doing his best to prove himself. And so you get a prove-yourself prove, prove type deal, right? Uh, Chinikov. $800,000 cap hit this year. I'm going to go out and say that's that's a bit of a bargain. Uh, 40 games played, 14 goals, 10 assists, 24 points. So, on pace for around 30 goals, if he played an entire 82-game schedule, which he won't. He's missed too many games, obviously, to play anywhere near 80 games. However, uh, how much is that worth? And again, there may be the possibility that they said, you know, with Kekalainen, we don't know if we're going to can have him do these do these contracts. Uh, Kent Johnson, $925,000 cap hit for him in 36 games, 6 goals, 10 assists, 16 points. Johnson's an interesting one because you could make the argument for an 8-year contract for Johnson based on some of the other draft picks, like top draft picks who've signed long-term deals before they've really taken off. I think of Dreisaitl in Edmonton uh, as being an obvious example. Jack Hughes in New Jersey is another uh, obviously, Kent Johnson wouldn't get that type of cap hit, but if he was looking for a long-term deal, I, I don't think it'd be crazy for them to at least sit down and talk about it. So if all of them, let's just say all of them get Band-Aid deals, they all get bridge deals, well, then you still have to deal with the defense. The defense is expensive, and this is just the reality of it. 
Wierenski has a no movement clause. I don't think Wierenski goes anywhere. $9.58 million contract in terms of cap hit. Uh, through 2028, 40 games, one goal, 29 assists, 30 points. Wierenski's their best defenseman. And it makes some sense to make sure that, you know, that no movement clause, I don't think he's going to get asked to waive that no matter who takes over as GM, no matter what the plan is. I think Wierenski's the one that, yeah, you can make an argument for trading him. And then it gets interesting. Now, Severson has a no trade clause, $6.25 million cap hit until 2031. That's a long contract for Severson in 37 games this year, six goals, 10 assists, 16 points. So with Severson, you know, I, I, rightfully you could ask that question of whether or not that contract makes sense with Columbus if we're going to be, you know, dealing with more rebuild discussions with Columbus. Then there's Provorov. Now there's some retained salary by Philadelphia in the deal. So his cap hit with Columbus is $4.725 million till 2025. 52 games, 4 goals, 19 assists, 23 points. Um, Provorov is, he's a decent defenseman. I think at times he gets overrated by some. Uh, I think he's been underrated some years as well. But again, the question becomes with this team, is Provorov going to, going to be a guy they keep around? Or the fact that he's up next year, maybe maybe he decides he wants to move on. Maybe this coming summer we see Provorov moved. Maybe it's sooner than that. Maybe a new GM sits down, talks to him first, and says, all right. Uh, Good Branson, modified no trade clause for Good Branson. Uh, $4 million cap hit until 2026. When they signed this deal, a lot of people furrowed their brows and clicked their tongues and weren't very happy about it. Uh, 48 games, 3 goals, 12 assists, 15 points. You know what? Good Branson's played pretty well. Um, all things considered, I think Good Branson has not been the issue on the blue line for Columbus. I think there's there's been some issues there. I, I think the overall cost of the blue line is part of an issue, but not that they have a cap space talk, uh, issue. That I'll, I'll talk about their cap space once we get down there. Uh, Peak, $2.75 million contract till 2026. He's only played 20 games. He's had six assists. I have seen Columbus fans uh, anxious to see Peak uh, maybe end up being moved. Uh, Boquist is one that I think they've they've tried to move. He has a $2.6 million cap hit. Uh, he's a restricted free agent next year, uh, but he's only played 22 games and had seven assists. So in this in this league where cap hits are are basically very, very important to keep under control, that $2.6 million might be a little bit, little bit rich for another team. So unless they do a retained salary deal where maybe they eat half of it, but even then, I, I think they'd have a hard time making that trade. Uh, and then there's Jake Bean, $2.33 million. Uh, he's a restricted free agent this summer in 49 games, 4 goals, 5 assists, 9 points. So you've got 7 defensemen here, and the cheapest of the 7 defensemen is making $2.33 million. It's not ideal. Your number 7 defenseman should be making around $900,000 a year. So what's interesting with this is that I, I think we can agree this is probably an expensive blue line that they have. So a new GM is going to have to deal with that. But this is a team that has over $12 million in cap space. Just imagine if they could create just a little bit more, then maybe you're a player in the free agent market in July. Anyways, uh, then you've got in net. Now, Elvis um, wanted, wanted to be traded, but apparently the market's been cold for him. Uh, he has a modified no trade clause, uh, $5.4 million cap hit till 2027. Uh, this year's record, 9-11 and 7 with a 904 save percentage. His numbers haven't been bad. I, I kind of understand why he might be a little bit upset that he's not getting more starts because Tarasov's numbers haven't been great. Tarasov, $1.05 million cap hit until next year where he's a restricted free agent again. His record's 3-6-2, and, and he has an 8.77 save percentage. So just by the numbers alone, Elvis has been the better goaltender. Uh, in all likelihood, Elvis is going to be sticking around as the goaltender for Columbus, um, at least for the rest of this season. We'll see if Elvis is still their goaltender next year. But there are some, some discussion points here, and then that brings us to Patrick Laine. Patrick Laine, of course, currently in the player assistance program, and I hope he gets... Any help he needs, he has a modified no trade clause, but he has an $8.7 million cap hit until 2026, and he's only played 18 games, six goals, three assists, nine points in the 18 games he's played. So there is a question mark there of when you get line A back in the lineup, you know, 
where do you, where, what is the plan going forward? And is Line A going to be part of a long-term plan with Columbus? Or does his name end up being out there for trade? So some, some notables when you're looking through the era that was overseen by Yarmo Kekalainen and Columbus. Uh, they hired Mike Babcock July the 1st of last summer. And uh, then he resigned on September 17th of, of last year. And of course, all of the, 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 the Babcock conversations we were having in September, uh, and a lot of it came back onto Kakalainen. A lot of it came back to, well, the GM that hired him. And, and I, I, I don't know that that had anything to do with what we saw today, but it can't have helped. Has to have been part and parcel, right? Uh, because then you make a change with coach and things still don't get better. So you go out, you, you try to fix your blue line in the offseason with guys like Severson Provorov coming in. And then you bring in your coach and Babcock. That all falls apart. Uh, now, again, this was a good era most of the time under Yarmo. Uh, from 2017 through 2020, the Blue Jackets make the playoffs four straight seasons. And 2016-2017, the team had a season of 108 points. That is, to date, the only 100-point season the team has had. So there's been some success. There's definitely, there was, there was a good run of success under John Tortorella. As rough as that started, it ended up being the best, best era, and I think he was the best coach the team has had. Obviously, towards the end, it wasn't workable, but most of that run, Tortorella was pretty good, and so was the team. So they did upset Tampa in 2019, your most GM when that happens, and then they upset Toronto in 2020. And what was interesting was that between 2019 and 2020, you lose Panarin, Duchesne, and Bobrovsky, and the the Columbus Blue Jackets were basically left for dead at that point, and no. Uh, they, they proved themselves to be a team that could defy expectations. And part of that was when Bobrovsky's left, when Bobrovsky left, Corpusalo stepped in, and then so did Merce Leakins. Uh, Elvis, his initial run through the NHL, his numbers were fantastic. So this is a team that had some good success, I think that the exits of Panarin, Duchesne, Bobrovsky, all at that same time created this idea that, oh, nobody wants to play in Columbus, which I don't think is true at all. Um, I, and, and then signing Goudreau showed, yeah, no, they can, they can bring a guy in. Uh, and, and it does feel like Johnny Hockey could have got more money elsewhere, decided to, to challenge himself in Columbus. It just hasn't really worked out. And so Yarmo has been the victim of just circumstance here where... Uh, he makes moves that on paper look like they should be pretty good for the team. And then in practical, uh, on the practical side of it, it just hasn't worked out that well. Um, he also, uh, one thing to keep in mind here is, I talked about Line A earlier. Uh, I, I feel like trading Bjorkstrand, which was necessitated by the contract extension given to Line A and the fact they were $5.5 million above the cap at the time, uh, I, I feel like this team really missed Oliver Bjorkstrand. I think that, I mean, character gets thrown around as a term a lot. I do feel like they're they're short a couple of really good character forwards, maybe. But again, with Columbus, uh, this is a team that's nowhere near the playoffs right now. And so the question then becomes one of, is this a team that can be salvaged by a GM coming in? So brand new GM takes over, say, tomorrow. John Davidson finds the perfect GM tomorrow. And we see him come in and make moves that could get this team back to the playoffs in 2025. Or do we see him come in and just sell guys off and say, all right, we're going to have to, you know, do a, a rebuild slash retool and we're not going to be worried about playoffs in 2025. I will be interested to see which tactic is taken by the new general manager because it's not easy. It's not easy trading cap money. It may get a little bit easier with the cap going up this summer, and it should go up substantially. This is a team that does have over $12 million in cap space, so they could bring on a couple of contracts if they need to. But again, um, Columbus is, is looking for playoffs. They have been outside of the playoffs. This will be four straight seasons they've missed the playoffs. And after a run where they had four straight seasons in the playoffs, not great. Uh, th this is a team that I think has always sort of, I don't know if lacking an identity is the right way to go about it, but it, it has felt like um, a championship direction has never been established by the Columbus Blue Jackets. I've never really felt like, okay, this could be the year Columbus could do something really good. And I'd like to see that happen, in all honesty. I'd like to see Columbus go on a run. 
Uh, it just hasn't happened yet. So 2019 and 2020, those those upsets were nice. But wouldn't a run to a conference final or a Stanley Cup final look better for Columbus? I think it would. And the next GM has that challenge of trying to uh, right the ship. Either you find a way to get Johnny Goudreau producing or you figure something out. And the no movement clauses that are that's, that players here have, whether it's Wierenski, Goudreau, um, and I didn't go through all the no trade clauses on this team either, but no movement clauses basically are just an indicator of the player wants to have full, complete control over what happens during the contract. Doesn't mean a player won't waive that no movement clause to go somewhere else during the contract. They just want to have complete say over it, which I get. I get wanting to have that level of control. So what what would your first first step as a GM be? What do you think the first the first step should be by the next GM? And uh, yeah, what direction should the team take? Get back to being a playoff team, get back into contention, or just say, you know what, we've got some good young kids, go out to get some more prospects and do a gradual build. What would your plan be? Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe in the event that you haven't done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support as always. I will talk to you again soon.